All right, I want you to picture this scenario with me. <clears throat> Back in Corinth, when this letter was written, there were two main classes of people. There was the wealthy and the poor, the masters or the slaves, so to speak. Um, there were Jew and Gentile distinctions. There were male and female distinctions. But the, the wealthy-poor distinction was massive in society. It happens to be the one that Paul is addressing here in this passage. The wealthy master's slave owners had massive homes back in the day in which they would house their family, and many times that included extended family and in-laws and outlaws and slaves and their families as well. And, and most homes would have a central courtyard or an atrium, and it would be surrounded uh, by a kitchen and bedrooms and a dining room. And the dining room was called the triclinium. All right, so there's the atrium, triclinium. The triclinium was the dining room for the homeowners, for the elite and the wealthy. Uh, you had to be someone of status to eat in this room. And these rooms often seated up to 20 or so people, and they'd recline on couches, and, and they would eat. And uh, the servants and the slaves, the poor and the shunned family members, uh, would eat out in the atrium, sitting on the floor or standing. Uh, and so in typical Corinthian society, in an unbeliever's home, the free and wealthy homeowners and their well-to-do society friends, uh, they would gather in the triclinium, they would participate in idol worship rituals, they would eat meat offered to those idols, they would engage in sexual activity, and they would eat and they would drink in excess. And, and all the while, the slaves in the home, or maybe the guests who weren't so liked or of a different ethnicity or different status, uh, they, they brought food to these wealthy people, and then they would sit and they would watch them eat and drink, and they would sit on the floor out in the atrium to see if any food would be left for them. All right? And uh, when we piece together the issues that Paul was addressing in this letter to 1 Corinthians, uh, here is what I think could very well have been happening in this church. So the believers were gathering in the homes of wealthier Christians back then because there were no church buildings. This is the early, early church, right? And so they're meeting in one of these large homes, or maybe a couple of them spread throughout the city. And, uh, but what was happening is that they were coming together in the default mode that they were used to, the mode that was culturally ingrained in them, that they grew up with, right? And so everyone came to the home, and the poorer people would wait on the wealthier people. And then the wealthy sat in the triclinium, and the poor stood out in the atrium, right? And the wealthier, more likely, the ones who were claiming to be spiritually more mature than everyone else, were praying and preaching, prophesying from the triclinium, uh, and the others were out in the atrium just kind of listening in to what they could. And during these gatherings, then, they would partake in what was called the Lord's Supper, in that they would eat a meal together, which included the breaking of bread and the drinking of wine, like Jesus had told them to do. But what was most likely happening was that the wealthy and elite were in the triclinium eating meat offered to idols. Men were, like we learned last week, uncovering their heads, or no, covering their heads when they prayed. Women were uncovering their heads when they prayed, and some were falling into sexual sin, and the wealthy folks were eating and drinking until they were drunk. And while the poor and all the servants, still brothers and sisters in Christ, were out in the atrium watching all the shenanigans going on and waiting to see if any food would be left for them. And all this was being done in the name of Jesus. This was what their worship service looked like. You see, they hadn't changed their behavior. They were worshiping Jesus like they had worshiped the idols before. Uh, they were doing the same things they used to do, only now they were doing those things in the name of Jesus. They were most likely well-intentioned, you can be well-intentioned and still be in error, right? Uh, and just because someone does something in the name of Jesus doesn't mean that Jesus would approve. So Paul is taking the time by writing this letter to correct the Corinthian behavior in the church, right? Because their behavior was causing division, as you can tell by that kind of story. It was bringing shame upon the poor. It was promoting sexual immorality. It was confusing the lost, and it was not glorifying to the Lord Jesus. So the passage we're looking at today sounds like it's coming from a coach uh, in a locker room, so to speak. Out of the gate, Paul's like, hey, I can't say that you're doing a good job because you're not, right? In fact, your church gatherings are actually doing more good than harm. Ouch. <laughs> Imagine if I came up here one day and was like, hey, stuff just has to change. Our gatherings are not for the better, they're for the worse. 
I'm sure the response to that statement would be a little mixed, right, to say the least. And I'm sure the response from the Corinthian church to Paul's very straightforward uh, comments here was a bit mixed as well. But we're going to take a, a closer look at the threefold problem that Paul is addressing, and then we're going to look at the theological principle, which is then going to lead to the thankful practice, and those are your three points in your outline. So let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and let's just read verse 17 again so we get this fresh in our minds. But in the following instruction, I do not commend you because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. Right? That, I, that would be tough to hear. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, and another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So, they're eating and drinking together. Paul writes this, when you come together, he says this twice, when you come together. So he's talking about their church gatherings. And he says three things. He says, it's not for the better, it's for the worse, verse 17. He says, there's division among you, verse 18. And then, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat, verse 20. So how can Paul say that? What caused him to say that they were not eating the Lord's Supper, that they were, there were divisions among them, and they were gathering for the worse and not for the better? Well, for one, because when they came together to eat and worship, one went hungry and another went home drunk, Right? Uh, they were not eating the Lord's Supper because one person would go ahead and fill his belly to the full while excluding a poorer brother from eating any food at all. The modern translation of verse 22 would be, what in the world, right? Paul's like, don't you have houses to eat in? He's incredulous. He's like, are you for real? You come together to worship Jesus and remember his incredible sacrifice on the cross for you, and some of you are so selfish and so full of yourselves that you sit there in a drunken stupor while your brother in the faith doesn't even get a bite to eat. You can't even sacrifice a meal for one another? And here's what this tells me, said Paul. This is what your behavior towards one another says about you. He says, verse 22, you despise, you think little of the church of God. At the very least, you think less of the church of God, less of your brothers and sisters than you do of yourself. You are selfish and irreverent. You are self-centered and display contempt for God's own temple, the people of God. By, but your behavior says another thing about you, he says, and that is this. You humiliate or you put to shame those who have nothing or the poor. So you dishonor and disgrace those who are not as wealthy as you are. Your actions make them feel like they don't belong, like you don't want them there as if that choice were up to you. What is interesting is that the brother of Jesus had something to say about this subject as well. The Corinthians were succumbing to the sin of selfishness, self-centeredness, and partiality. And I'm going to read from James chapter 2, verse 1 to 13. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read uh, it from my notes. Here's what the brother of Jesus said. He said, my brothers and sisters. So he's talking to believers, right? He says, my brothers and sisters, do not show prejudice if you possess faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if someone comes into your assembly wearing a gold ring and fine clothing and a poor person enters in filthy clothes, do you pay attention to the one who is finely dressed and say, hey, you sit over here in a good place and to the poor person, you stand over there and sit on the floor. Think of triclinium and atrium, right? He's talking about this. If so, James says, have you not made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, did not God choose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he promised to those who love him? But, James continues, you have dishonored the poor. Are not the rich oppressing you and dragging you off into courts? Do they not blaspheme the good name of the one you belong to? But if you fulfill the royal law as expressed in this scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show prejudice, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as a violator. For the one who obeys the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. 
For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you commit murder, have, you have become a violator of the law. James finishes, speak and act as those who will be judged by a law that gives freedom. For judgment is merciless for the one who has shown no mercy. But mercy triumphs over judgment. I don't even need to add commentary to that passage. James hits the nail on the head. It's, he's very clear. How we treat one another is of ultimate importance. But why is it such a sin to despise the poor, or anyone for that matter, or to put them to shame, or to make them feel like they don't belong as part of the body? Well, the wisest king that ever lived tells us why. In his book of Proverbs, chapter 17, verse 5, Solomon says this, whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is my own paraphrase of what Paul wrote. He's like, what in the world? Don't you have houses to go home and eat and get drunk in? But you choose to leave out the poor and the people that make you feel uncomfortable or the ones you don't particularly like. And they must sit out in the atrium watching you get drunk and you do these despicable behavior when you come together to worship and remember Jesus. Are you trying to show contempt for the church of God by mocking those you don't care for? You know that when you mock your brothers and sisters in Christ that you are insulting the one who made them. That be the God you are saying you're worshiping at the moment. And that doesn't jive. What can I say to you to get you to understand this? This isn't for the better, it's for the worse. Because instead of loving God with all that you are and loving your neighbor as yourself, you are choosing to insult God by shaming his children. Should I praise you for this? Not hardly. You are acting like fools. And as our brother James put it, they were sinning. They, but the other statement that James made that's quite sobering as I was reflecting on this, it's, it's one of the laws of the universe that God has put into place. Something that James and Solomon and Jesus himself talked about. James said, judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Solomon said, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. And Jesus said, if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. How we treat one another is incredibly important to our Father. However, God has a purpose even in, in fractions and division. It's interesting. Look at verse 19 again. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. God oftentimes uses divisions and factions within the church to expose those who are frauds. God will use situations like what we've read about in 1 Corinthians thus far. In chapter 11, someone getting drunk while others are hungry, right? Or like men or, or women dressing inappropriately to draw attention to themselves and away from Jesus, chapter 11. Or like stubborn individuals who will claim that all things are lawful to excuse their idolatrous and sinful behavior, chapters 8 through 10. Or folks who claim that all things are lawful as justification to engage in sexual immorality, chapter 6. Or rich people taking poorer brothers and sisters in Christ to court, chapter 6. People in church dividing over high-profile personalities like pastors and apostles and questioning one another's salvation based upon who they follow, chapter 1. Corinthian church was a mess. But God will use the divisiveness of these situations to point out who is genuine, as he says, who is tried and true, who is approved. In other words, God uses these things to reveal who is a true believer in Jesus and who is is not. Interesting concept, isn't it? Paul warned the Ephesian church elders that from among your own selves, this is a scary, scary thing, from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Elders, the elders that Paul was talking to were admonished to deal with divisive people. And now Paul is not advocating for divisiveness or division, but he is saying that God sometimes uses it to point out those who are not tried and true. And Jesus said, by their fruits, you will know them. So if certain people within the Corinthian church heard this rebuke from Paul and were unrepentant, they didn't change, and told Paul to basically take a hike, then that was pretty good indication that they were not genuine believers. They were only there for themselves and not for God and others. They were despising God's church, shaming those who were poor, and thus insulting their maker. 
And so this was the problem in the Corinthian church. But before Paul could give them the the fix, Paul has to take them back to, and this is really important, theological truth in order to shed light on their doctrine and thus correct their misapplication. All right, So he has to take them back to theological truth in order to shed light on their doctrine and thus correct their misapplication. The same goes for us. We can't skip to the application, to, to, the, to the what we do about it part. We must always go back to the gospel. We must always go back to the one who did it for us. We must always go back to good theological dogma first. And that's where Paul takes us, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Let's go through this. Paul says he received this from the Lord. So what Paul is going to remind them of here was directly given to him by the Lord Jesus, and he delivered it to them just as Jesus had commanded. And these verses are pretty straightforward because we recite this portion every time we take the Lord's Supper together which is good, but don't let the familiarity cause you to tune out or lose the progression of Paul's argument. It's really important. Jesus broke bread and gave thanks. And then he he broke the bread and told the disciples to eat it in remembrance of him. Verse 24. And in the same way, he took the cup and he told the disciples to drink it in remembrance of him. Verse 25. Why were they to do this? It was a reminder, verse 26. Whenever we do this together, think of when we do this on Sundays and all that, right? Whenever we do this together, we proclaim, we declare, we preach, we show, we announce, we teach one another about the Lord's death and his imminent return until he comes again. And we preach the gospel to one another every time we eat and drink together. Our eating and drinking displays the gospel to everyone who's in attendance. That's important stuff because the gospel is the center of our unity. Okay, This is the the, the act of eating and drinking together is a remembrance of Jesus, a reminder of the covenant relationship we have with him, and it is a proclamation of the gospel to one another. The act of eating and drinking together promotes unity that we share in Jesus Christ, who is the central focus of that meal. In eating and drinking together, we are demonstrating to one another that none of us deserves to be here. But we are all here by the grace of God. None of us is good enough to be here, but we have all been made righteous by faith in the death of Jesus. None of us is without sin, but we are all forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And those things are not just true about me. They are true about you. And they're not just true about you. They're true about the one that you like least in this room. The Lord's table levels the playing field and is meant to humble us in the remembrance of Jesus went through for each one of us. You see, there is significance in the acts that we do. Therefore, Paul says, because of Jesus' command, because it is a thankful reminder of what Jesus did for us, and because it is a time to preach the gospel to one another and to promote unity, therefore whoever eats or drinks in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of Jesus. Whoa, what does that mean, right? First, what does Paul mean by an unworthy manner? A better word for unworthy would be irreverently. 
verse 27 and 29. So eating and drinking in an unworthy manner simply means in an irreverent way. <clears throat> and in context, an irreverent way of eating and drinking is to disregard or to despise the people you are eating and drinking with. To shame and humiliate the poor or those who are different than you or those you might not like very much. So whoever eats irreverently in that way will be guilty. I want you to remember back to chapter 8, verse 1. Paul was talking about eating meat offered to idols and Paul made this interesting statement. He said, thus, when you eat that, you're sinning against your brother and when you sin against your brother, you are sinning against Christ. And here in 1127, it's the same idea. Eating in an irreverent manner is sinning against the poorer brothers and sisters in Christ, and in sinning against them, we're sinning against the Lord Jesus. If someone is guilty of sinning against their brother and sister in Christ, the body of, of Christ himself, Paul says they are guilty or deserving of punishment. And what kind of punishment is Paul talking about? I want you to hold that thought. We'll come to that in a second. But first, another of Paul's statements. He says, so that one would not be guilty of the body and blood of Jesus, let a person examine himself or scrutinize himself and then eat and drink. Verse 28. Now this verse has been taken out of context and applied inappropriately in many ways. Some folks read this as a call to deep personal self-scrutiny of our innermost thoughts and motives and consciences and making sure that we have no unconfessed sin in our lives before we take the bread and wine. I remember being as a kid, sitting there, thinking through my week. What did I do? What did I do? That's not what it's talking about. This is not the kind of scrutiny Paul is talking about. In context, Paul is asking them to consider their actions while they are eating and drinking. They were to ask themselves, were they taking their own food and leaving the dregs for the brothers and sisters? Were they excluding their brothers and sisters by eating in a separate room or eating in any way excluding them from what's going on? Were their actions causing division or unity? And Paul's asking them to consider how their actions were either enhancing the gospel or detracting from the gospel of Jesus. Because if one eats and drinks irreverently by shunning the poor, the outcasts, those they don't like, and selfishly eating all the food, or as the ESV puts it, without discerning the body, meaning without being sensitive to the fact that the poor, the outcasts, the unliked were part of the body, then that person eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Now, punishment, judgment, discipline. Many of us, we don't like to hear those terms. It makes us feel uncomfortable. We skirm in our seats to think about God's judgment and God's discipline. We hold to the theory that once we are saved, God will never punish us in any way for anything that we ever do. We go scot-free because of grace. But let me remind you that this passage was written to believers, those who were saved by grace through faith. And in chapter 1, Paul called them saints, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. But now, Paul says, anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Like, how does that work, right? Well, I'm going to let Scripture challenge our thinking <clears throat> that once we are saved, God will never punish us in any way for anything that we do. I'm going to read from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I want you to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Hebrews chapter 12. You can turn there or you can listen to me as I read. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. The author of Hebrews is writing to believers. He says, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, talking about earthly fathers, but he, God, disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Hmm. Proverbs chapter 3. find my spot. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11. 
My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as the father the son in whom he delights. Okay. One more. Revelation chapter 3. You guys want me to preach from Revelation? Well, here you go. Revelation chapter 3. He's writing to the church in Laodicea. This is Jesus speaking to a church. Always got to remember that. This is Jesus, our Savior, speaking to a church. He says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because of you, you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am, think of the Corinthians, you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched and pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Here's the point. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The Laodicean church sounds just like the Corinthian church. They were wealthy, affluent, arrogant, and selfish. And they're like, we're rich. We don't need anything. And Jesus says, to, whom, to those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. And here I am. I'm standing at the door, and I'm knocking. I'm like those poor outcasts in the atrium, right? If you open the door, I will come in, and I will eat with you, and you with me. That idea of eating and drinking together. And as Jesus said in his parable to the sheep and goats, right? Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Moral of the story, how we treat one another is how we treat Jesus. And God will discipline us so that we conform to his will. This means that God reserves the right to punish those whom he will and to show mercy to those whom he will so that we may not be condemned along with the world. God teaches us, disciplines us, trains us so that we may become more like Jesus and so we will not be condemned along with the world. Like what the author of Hebrews said, earthly fathers discipline their children for their own good so they won't end up maimed or, or dead or hurt or in jail. Why, why might we slap our, hands, our kid's hand away from the, the stove when he's reaching for it? We don't want him to burn himself, right? Why do we take away the car keys of a child who gets a speeding ticket? Because we don't want them to end up dead or maimed, right? So Paul says, examine yourself, scrutinize yourself so that God, like a good father, doesn't have to discipline you. We'll come back to that examination, scrutinization idea in a few minutes. Finally, the thankful practice, verse 33. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. The other things I will give you directions when I come. So what is the purpose of remembrance? This is important. What is the purpose of an anniversary, a ritual, or a holiday? Why do us married folks remember our wedding day? Right? Why do we celebrate birthdays? Why do we as a nation celebrate 4th of July? Why do we do child dedication each year? Right? It's a reminder of the promise that was made in case of wedding anniversary. It's a celebration of new life, as in a birthday. It's a reminiscence of a sacrifice endured as 4th of July. It's a remembrance of a commitment that was made, child dedication. Undergirding all of that is an attitude of gratitude. When we go out to eat in celebration of our anniversary, Kelly and I are grateful for the fact that we have shared and endured another year together, right? That God has graced us with the blessing of our relationship. And we eat and we drink in remembrance and with thanksgiving of all that he brought us through to that point. And when we prepare a big dinner and take a bake a delicious cake for birthday party, we eat and we sing in gratitude to God for what, another year of a life shared together with that person. We eat and drink in remembrance with them 
in Thanksgiving. When we cook a good old-fashioned Wisconsin brat on the charcoal grill with all of our friends on the 4th of July, we celebrate the fact that we're free and we're thankful for the prosperity we enjoy and the relationships that we hold dear. We eat and we drink in remembrance and thanksgiving. This is the idea behind the Lord's Supper. We do as Jesus commanded, not just because it's a command, but because we have attitudes of gratitude. We take bread and we drink wine in remembrance of the sacrifice Jesus made for us. And at the same time, we celebrate the new life that Jesus has given to us through his resurrection from the dead. And we are thankful for the promises that Jesus made to us. Promises like whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. And the eating of the bread and drinking of the cup is a solemn and thankful celebration as we focus our attention on the most important person in the room, that being Jesus, who made it all possible for us. The one who saved us, the one who forgave us, the one who caused us to be born again, the one who joined us into the Father's family, the one who unifies us together with one another. And that is a lot to be grateful for. And we should come to the Lord's table with grateful and humble hearts, understanding that we are all there on equal ground. None of us deserves to be there. The rich don't deserve it more than the poor. The Jew isn't priority over the Gentile. Men are not before the women. The master is not more important than the slave. We are all there to remember Jesus and to be grateful for the life and freedom that he has given to each one of us. We preach the gospel to one another when we do this. And so Paul says, when you come together to eat and drink, wait for one another. Another way of putting this is share with one another. Or as he looked, he put it earlier, look out for one another. Seek the advantage of one another. To tie it back to the last chapter, seek the good of one another. In other words, treat one another as you would like to be treated. And this goes for all who have placed their faith in Jesus, the new convert who may still be struggling with consequences of his or her former life, the poor person who can't rub two nickels together, the introvert who doesn't like to be in big groups, the extrovert who can be annoying, the holier-than-thou person who thinks he's so mature, the emotionally frazzled person who needs some attention, the mentally challenged person who's difficult to understand, the elder who's just like everyone else, the widow who's lonely, the employee who is just a cog in the machine all week long, the CEO who struggles with his own importance, the chronically sick who is discouraged and depressed, the sinner who needs to repent, the child who is innocent in their belief, the teen who's barely believing. This is the time for us all to come together and to have our attention focused upon our great and awesome God who did not seek his own good but the good of each one of us. To remember that our Savior did not spare his own life, but gave it up for us all. To be thankful for our King who did not seek his own advantage, but the advantage of all of us. To humbly and honestly eat and drink and sing and pray and worship and praise our God together. To come with an attitude of gratitude for Jesus and to come with an attitude of gratitude for one another. So Paul says, if you're hungry, go home and eat. In other words, if you're coming here to fill your own belly, your fleshly desires, just stay at home. Because look at how Paul sandwiches these, this passage. Verse 20 and 21. When you come together, one's hungry. Don't you have houses to eat in? Verse 34. When you come together, if one is hungry, eat at home. His point, you see, satisfying your hunger is not the reason that we come together. Our feasts, our worship times, our Lord's suppers, our generations, our gatherings are not for the purpose of filling our bellies, spiritual or physical. When we come together, it's for the purpose of giving glory to God and building one another up in love. Church is not about you. It's about every one of us, right? A question that arises in each of us, though, because we're human and we're sinful, is this. Will I be blessed and will my needs be met if I gather with God's people and I seek their advantage over my own, Right? We ask that question of ourselves. The answer is sometimes not. There are times when we gather and there is a crisis going on over here and as a body we rally around and we comfort and assist those folks. And at other times, there's going to be a celebration over here and we're going to rally around those people and praise and rejoice in God with those folks over there. But here's the amazing thing about how God works. When I adopt the attitude of Jesus, seeking the advantage of the others over my own and being willing to look to the interests of others instead of my own, I go home feeling entirely blessed. Obedience and love brings inherent blessing. 
And the Holy Spirit just does that because that's who he is. And when my turn comes, when the crisis hits or the celebration is in order, the body will rally around me because the Spirit will lead them to do that out of love and genuine care. And so when we come together as a church or when we gather as a family around our dinner tables or when we gather with friends for a time of fellowship or a time of working together, whether we eat or we drink or whatever we do, together we do all for the glory of God with an attitude of gratitude for him and for one another. Now, if perhaps that does not happen to be the disposition of your heart. Perhaps when you come together with your brothers and sisters in Christ, it is not with a grateful heart. Perhaps you come each week looking for what you can get out of the church body. Perhaps you come expecting your needs to be met. Perhaps you come hoping everyone will focus on you. Perhaps you come inviting your close brothers and sisters to sit by you while encouraging the ones you're not comfortable with to sit over there. Perhaps you come harboring a heart of resentment against a brother or sister. And according to Paul, you should scrutinize your heart so that when you come together, it will not be for discipline, but instead for the good of all. I'm going to conclude this message by reading one of Jesus' parables. In it, Jesus creatively describes an an attitude of ingratitude for an incredible gift of grace. The attitude of ingratitude is displayed in how the actor in the parable treats someone else. As I read this, I want you to listen to what Jesus is saying. Scrutinize your hearts to see if you may be leaning in the direction of gathering with an attitude of ingratitude or if you gather together with a genuine heart of gratitude for one another. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. Just listen to Jesus' words. Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? How about seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold and his wife and children, all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And when Then the master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until they should pay, until he should pay all his debt, discipline. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Let's pray. Father, just thank you for your word. It is so good. It is true, and it is right, and it is just, and it's holy, and it tells us how to live. It corrects us where we're wrong. And your Holy Spirit gives us power to obey. And we ask, God, that if there's places in our hearts and lives where we are not grateful for what you have done or for what you are doing in the lives of those around us, God, that you would convict us and then that you would give us the strength to repent and to fall in step with you and to be grateful for one another because what we enjoy in this room and what we enjoy with one another is a heavenly thing. This is not an earthly gathering. This is a heavenly kingdom that we get to participate in now. What a beautiful thing. What a joyous occasion. What a glorious thing. God, thank you so much. Thank you that we were able to enjoy these children dedicated to you this morning. 
that we have families wanting to raise their kids to honor and glorify you and to know you and to love you. Be with them, bless them. As a congregation, may we rally around that, that heart that desires to, to live for you, for your kingdom. God, make us one. Unite our hearts for the good of your people and for the glory of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.